Elijah a single portion, got him to close the heavens up, rain didn't come, did amazing things. He prophesied amazing things. But uh, Elisha's double portion, raised the dead, cleansed the leper. I believe God's gonna move on you right now It put a healing movement in this house, in this place. We're we're in an amazing time. My wife and I, we're in the middle of a move. We've been on the move. We've been in transition. How many like Larry's message earlier? And about transition and times of transition, we're in all transition. God's repositioning us. He's putting us into place. He's uh, moving us out of the place that we were and then now moving us into the place that he wants to be. That's where we want to be is where God is because it's important that we do what it is that he's doing and in the place that he calls us to be. There's something about geography when God calls you to a place that he begins to release a new thing upon you and uh, that thing is always Uh, better than what you had before. We go from glory to glory. And so my wife and I were in the middle of another transition. We transitioned only a couple years ago from pastoring. We were pastoring in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, then we moved down to South Carolina, sunny South Carolina. We've been down there for the last year and a half. Anybody from South Carolina? Okay, bless you. And uh, we've been down there for the last year and a half and uh, it's been like vacation for us. And because the Lord spoke to me and he told me the only thing he wanted me to do or to to do in the land, uh, he gave me a dream. He said, the only thing I want you to do for this land is mow your grass. And so I had that dream and it came to pass, just mowed my grass. That's all I did. And, uh, but then we traveled and did some media stuff there and, and abroad and filmed some television, had some wonderful experiences. And, uh, and then some of our stuff, uh, that we filmed actually, is bound for Netflix with 44 million subscribers. You know, it's an amazing time we're living in where people want to see Jesus on display. You know, it's an amazing, amazing time. And so we're a part of that, and we get to uh, do amazing things with some phenomenal people, uh, media-wise, and filming what it is that God is up to. But then last year, I had a, an encounter with the Lord, and I, I, something began to shift in my life and we started hearing a new call and God's been uh, moving our heart and saying he, he has something new for us to do and new for us to build. And so we're in the middle of a move. We're actually moving as a family to Nashville, Tennessee. And so we're excited because there's some good music there, good people and uh, great worship. And so we're, we're excited. We're about to move out there in June. June 1st is our move date. And it was really by the Holy Spirit's direction. We didn't uh, have any certain plan, but the Holy Spirit spoke to us and made it so abundantly clear that we were supposed to be there. So we're in the middle of moving. I told Larry, we're going to be next door neighbors. He's pastoring a church there. I said, Larry, I won't be a member, but I will expect pastoral visits. And so we're going to be neighbors and we're going to hang out and, uh, and it's just going to be a good time. But I believe there's something new God is doing and uh, I just want to really kind of lay some groundwork for this, cast some vision for this because I had an encounter last year that really has catapulted us into a new direction of ministry that something, something began to shift in my heart uh, uh, ministry-wise around September, October of last year. And it's been a season of acceleration, a season that, you know, he says, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. And, uh, and so I began to pray, God, pour out a blessing that I can't contain. But then I changed my prayer. No, God, pour out a blessing. Just give me bigger containers. I'm asking for bigger containers because we've been in a season where we've been having to expand our containers. So much good stuff is happening right now. We're in acceleration. We're, we're in a season of destiny, a season of outpouring. And, uh, and it's been a phenomenal, a phenomenal turn of events. And some new passions and new desires have formed in us. How many know that God works in your desire? You know, the word desire, I've heard this is of the Father. This is what the word desire of the Father means. It means that 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 thing that God put inside of your heart comes from Him. 
He put it in you. It's of his desire. He wants you to flow in that thing that he put inside of you. But the biggest struggle is getting what is on the inside of you outside of you. You got it on the inside of you and you're trying to shape it with words. You're trying to communicate it. And yet there's something God is doing in the middle of your heart, in the middle of your spirit, man. And he wants to get it outside of you and change the environment that you're in right now. So we're in the middle of a moment where God is giving us a download. And some of, sometimes, you know, when you get a download, some files are bigger than others. And it's hard to unpack you're trying to unpack, uncompress this download. God's given you a major download. It's a major key for you and for others. And we've been in a, like, like I think it's been maybe seven months of receiving this download. And something has begun to shift, and it was taking me by surprise. It totally took me by surprise, and here's how it all began. I went up to Edmonton, Alberta last year, way up north, and to the cold, frozen, chosen people of God. You know, I mean, it was freezing there. And they said, we're going to go after some miracles. And I was hanging out with a good friend of mine, Sammy Robinson, and some others up there. And we just began to do some meetings. And something broke open that I had not seen in a while. And it all started with this young man, where there was this young man there. And I came up on him just to prophesy like any other ministry uh, meeting that I've done in the past. And something began to, to shift in that meeting. It was powerful. And it stunned me because I didn't know what was about to happen. I came up on him, and we just began to prophesy. He's a young man, and I began to speak a word over him that he was to get ready to run, that God was going to move him into running. And I actually spoke out of my mouth. I said, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> Have you ever heard something come out of your mouth, and you're like, I got to take that back, but it's by the Holy Spirit? I thought, whoa, what is going on? So he, he stood up, he came forward, I said, I see God is going to put a runner spirit on you, you're going to run, stand up, get up here and run. He stood up in front of everyone and, and ran from one place in the room all the way to the other and almost hit face forward into, into the wall. He almost fell dove face forward into the wall. He stopped and turned back in his tracks and ran back to the same place that he was seated, seated before and he sat down. And I thought, man, this kid is really embracing this word. This is incredible. I was excited. This was like amazing to me. He sits down, and then the Holy Spirit gives me a name. I said, who's Joshua? And he says, that's my name. And so I said, thank God you gave me his name, Lord. He's not for us. He's Joshua, Lord. <laughs> and so we just spoke over him. Joshua, you're going to run. You're going to be a generation of runners that's going to run with God. And you're going to, I, I see athletic performance on your life and all of this amazing stuff. So he, he's excited. I'm excited about the word. I come back a couple of weeks later because something broke open and we began to do consecutive meetings every night. And over those three weeks, we saw 100% accuracy in healing. It was an amazing, amazing thing. Something broke open, healing broke open, unlike I had ever seen before. And I mean, there were things that we've seen overseas, but in, 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 in uh, this area, this region of the world, it's, we're like, where is God? But God is here and he's moving. Something is happening. And so I came back a few weeks later and I said to my friend, man, that, remember that night when that young man, he was in the crowd, he stood up. He ran. That was a powerful moment. He said, yeah, that was crazy. I said, yes. I've never seen someone embrace a word like that. Just, I mean, the kid almost dove head first into the wall. He was running so fast. What's his deal? And I, and I said, that just blew me away. He goes, I know, I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. I said, I think it really, that was a tipping point. Something broke open in the spirit when that kid stood up for this region. And he says, yeah, I know. It's super weird. I said, yeah, I'm just amazed how God is so good. He just touched that kid, but he really embraced the word. He ran so hard. He said, yeah, it's amazing to me because you know that kid had problems walking. I'm like, what? Why didn't you tell me this? I've been, I've been three weeks just thinking that kid just really just gave it his all, 100% passion. 
Something broke open. It was a healing wave that I believe is coming back to the body. And so I'm prophesying over you today that there's a healing wave going to hit. Cancers and every form of sickness will be dealt with that I'm talking about every form of mental illness will have a power demonstration by the Holy Spirit that God is going to move through human beings, you and I in this hour, and touch people, heal people. There's a, ma- there's a massive healing wave that's hitting right now. And suddenly something broke open. And since then, we've seen more people walk out of wheelchairs than all 15, 20 years of ministry. It's been a phenomenal outpouring, an outbreak, and I believe God wants to release a healing wave in here this morning. Are you ready for that? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Luke chapter 4 because I want to lay the groundwork for this because this is a prophetic movement. We are in a prophetic awakening, and I don't believe we've actually hit uh, the, the understood the fullness of what it looks like to be prophetic. And, you know, Moses says, I would that all of God's people were prophets, I would, I would that all of God's people were prophetic. First Corinthians, Paul tells us this, that you may all prophesy one by one. Every one of us can prophesy. Maybe you're a veteran or maybe you're new to this, but every single believer can prophesy. You'd be surprised that who can prophesy the most accurate things in your life. My daughter, who's one of the most accurate prophetic voices for us, speaks over us prophetic things. I mean, on a weekly basis, she'll come out and she'll tell us things that God is saying to her about us as a family. It's an amazing thing to watch this next generation growing up with God and doing the things of Jesus, prophesying, healing the sick. But my daughter, she came out, we had put our house on the market when we're moving from South Carolina to Nashville. We put our house on the market. And first week, somebody bought it, and then it fell through only three days before the closing. It was a massive uh, heartbreak. We were just, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? You ever have a setback right like that? And you're like, God, are you actually in this? How does this happen three days before the closing? So we put it back on the market And two months go by and no one's biting. We're like, what's going on? What's wrong? Something's wrong. My daughter, uh, she comes out. My wife and I actually were having a little conversation. We said, you know, we should really take it off the market. Let's just take it off the market. Let's just see what God's going to do. I don't know. Let's do it. If nobody buys it by this weekend, let's just take it off the market. So my daughter, that next morning, she wakes up. She says, Daddy, I had a dream. I said, what is it? She said, God spoke to me. Someone's going to buy the house. It's a woman. And she really, really, really wants it. I said, oh, that's nice. I'm thinking, wow, phenomenal. Thank you, Jesus. You're speaking to my daughter, but it's a nice prophecy, honey. We're taking it off the market. That's what I'm thinking in my head. And she says, no, daddy. She really, really, really wants it. And God told me that she's going to buy it by Saturday. What do you do when a seven-year-old tells you that? She says, he's going to buy it by Saturday. I'm like, praise God. It's Wednesday. We get a phone call. Only a... 11 a.m., we'd like to see your home. We got to clean, get everything cleaned up. So we cleaned the whole place, and literally by Friday, we had locked in a deal, completely locked in a deal, and literally a deal that we couldn't, it's beyond everything we could imagine and hope for, and God just totally answered us. It's amazing. When you surround yourself in this environment, God speaks. He gives you a cutting edge. He gives you an X factor. You couldn't have any other way by hearing the voice of God. And so there's a, this prophetic movement that's emerging right now. And I don't believe we've seen the fullness of what it looks like or understand the fullness of what it looks like. And so I begin to see something different about the prophetic movement and about prophetic people. How we're hardwired in a different way. We're we're actually hardwired for so much more. And yet we've 
we, we've minimized ourselves, and it's amazing how the prophetic movement has kind of become a one-size-fits-all type of thing. But I believe God's going to give you an individual anointing, a unique anointing to you that you have an accuracy in a specific area that no one else knows how to touch in the heart of God. It's not one size fits all. You have something unique to you. You may flow in a word of knowledge and your specialty, the way your grace operates is you may know people's information numbers. You know, I remember I was at a meeting and I, I, I was trying to practice to learn words of knowledge and I, I, I got up, it was actually at a church that I was pastoring at the time and I was prophesying and I was just trying to go for words of knowledge, word of knowledge, word of knowledge. And I couldn't get anything right. Every single word of knowledge I was giving from the stage was wrong. It's like, what's wrong with me? I was so discouraged. At the end of it, a family came up, no longer on the microphone, just me and this family. And I'm standing there, and I hear this word in my spirit, banker, banker, banker. And I'm like, God, what are you saying? He says, banker. <laughs> and so I say to this man, are you a banker? And he goes, no. <laughs> I said, ah. Oh. And immediately these numbers come to my mind. Now I could have stopped right there and said, God, you know I've got a bad track record at this moment. I've got a terrible track record at this moment. God, I can't do this. I had given words of knowledge. They were all failing, falling short. Then I tried banker. That didn't even work. So I said, look, I don't know what this is, but are these numbers your bank account? He says, yes, they are. <laughs> and I said, is this how much money you have in the bank account? It was his bank account numbers and the amount that he had in the bank account. I didn't know what to do. So I just prophesied, double it. I just prophesied God was going to double it. When in doubt, double it. Several prayers you must learn to pray. More Lord. Double it and increase. I said, God's going to double it. And he said, Amen. You know, it's amazing how God just takes us by surprise and he does amazing things and he uses ordinary people to do incredible things. And you and I are the same. We're no different than that. We're bound for extraordinary things. And Luke 4, I think, gives us a glimpse of what it is that Jesus is doing with us today. And if I could just show you from this passage where I, I feel we are as a movement in a prophetic culture, we are in a time of an outpouring of healing. And I believe that God is going to merge the prophetic and healing together. And there's going to be a revival of healing that is not just to window shop or prophesy future things, but that it would hit people's bodies. It would touch people and revive them where they're at. And that you and I are, I believe, in the middle of what it is that God wants to do when it comes to this emerging prophetic movement. It's a culture of healing being established. People are more open to this than ever before. People want healing. People need healing. And they're willing to go outside of their normal spheres. They're willing to go beyond their doctor. Maybe they'll go to Mexico. Maybe they'll go for a vacation that's, that's one of those hospital vacations, you know? I mean, people are willing to go anywhere to get healed. And I feel in this time and in this day, for such a time as this, God has prepared us to walk right into this emerging healing movement and have a prophetic answer for what it is that God is up to. 
But Jesus says this in Luke 4, 18, after he had been tested by the enemy, the enemy had come to him and tested him in three areas. Number one, he tested him in his own appetite, in his hunger. He tested in him in his, his natural cravings as a human being. Maybe you've been through that testing and you get tested. Is God gonna meet my needs? Is he actually going to meet my natural needs because I have need for food. I like good cappuccino. Is he gonna provide for me more than enough? Yes, he is. And so he doesn't need to, to give himself to his cravings because he knows God is going to provide for what he needs. Then his second testing is his worship. What will you worship? And he says, if you bow before me, I'll give, you, I'll give you access to all this. I'll give you authority to all this. What are you going to focus on? Because focus is worship. What are you focusing 90% of your time on? I don't know about you, but I'm getting convicted lately that I'm like, God, I worship you. And he's like, why are you looking at that thing? Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul, I live for, like, 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 you know. <laughs> what are you focusing on? Because whatever you focus on, you're going to connect with. I want to put a screensaver on my phone that says, put me down. Pick it up, I'm like, hey, put me down. What are you focusing on? Because what you focus on, you're gonna have authority over, right? You're gonna, or it's gonna have authority over you. And so it's key that we keep our eyes on Jesus in this time. He wants to give us focus, laser-like focus, that we can see what it is that he's up to and have heavenly perspective, a new set of eyes on the circumstance that we're in. But then number three, he tests you in your identity. You get tested, especially when you begin to operate in the miraculous. Because if you measure yourself by the miracle, you'll always fall short of the glory of God. There was a man at the end of one of my meetings, and he came up to me. It wasn't a great meeting. It was a, just a, a, you know, another meeting. He came up to me, and I was disappointed. I was hungry for more. He came up, he put his hand on my chest. He says, that was good, but it wasn't good enough. I said, excuse me? I backed off because I knew he's a good man, but I knew the spirit that was coming out of him in that moment. It was questioning my identity. And if we, if we equate our value to the type of miracle that we're manifesting, we'll miss the mark. But when we begin to see Jesus and recognize that it's him doing these works, we'll start to magnify the king of glory. We'll give him the praise. I walk, I mean, when a, a miracle happens, I walk away, I go, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, thank God. You ever had a moment where you pray for someone and you're, it, you're on a bad day and you walk away going, that for sure wasn't me. I might, I might have been backslidden a few minutes ago. That wasn't me. But you know, when Jesus comes and you're, you're living in that, that, the grace of heaven, everything becomes easy. It's important that we still recognize that. That we go, it's Jesus. It's him. He's the miracle worker. And so he questions him in his identity. And he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off this temple. For he shall give his angels charge over you. How many know that God doesn't speak in ifs? He doesn't speak in ifs. He never says, if you are, if you are. The enemy speaks in ifs because if is a proof. He wants you to prove that you are. If you are, then do this. But he always says up front, you're my son. You're my daughter. And it, it's blown my mind because he's begun to speak to me some things that he wants to do. And he lets me know all the time that he's the one doing them. 
I was in a meeting the other day and I said, God, what do you want to do tonight? He said, I want to do crazy miracles. This was the beginning of the meeting. I hadn't even got up there yet. I said, God, I don't know if I have faith for that. And he says, well, then get out of my way. He's the miracle worker. And so he, Jesus, after Luke 4, he goes, goes through these testings and he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's now walking back in the power of the Spirit. There's another dimension of God's presence. How many know that God's in us for us, but he's on us for the world around us? He's on us to transform the world around us. And so Jesus returns, it says, in the power of the Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke 4, 1. But in, four, in 14, he returns in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit. And it's amazing to me, this is a big controversy, that people go, well, can you be a Christian and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Can you be a Christian and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, then I began to read Jesus. It wasn't until he was 30 years old that he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can he be the Son of God and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, he did for 30 years. 30 years. How did he do that? He, felt, he, he fully pleased the Father. You know, some people say that before Jesus did anything, God said, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. No, he lived 30 years of blameless life under the law. And so at the age of 30, he heard the Father's voice, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Not because he didn't do anything, but he demonstrated obedience. He demonstrated he was a son by living out this life of obedience to the Father. Then he gets filled with the Holy Spirit and a new level or a new measure of ministry begins to happen. He's no longer just teaching out of the law, but he comes back to the synagogue. It says this, that he opens the book and in verse 18, he reads this from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Say anointed. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable and favorable year of the Lord. God wants to put a favor on you. He wants to cause his favor to be seen, but it, it's only in understanding the master commission of Jesus. God wants to bless you, but it's when we get into what it is that he's up to that the blessing comes. Jesus wasn't just saying, hey, I'm here just to say God's favor is on everyone. He had a mission. And he, those that would come into alignment with that mission, with that purpose, they would walk in the favor of God. And it's amazing that he leaves something out. I don't know if you've ever seen this. But Jesus intentionally left something out. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 is, this, is, is what he's referencing from Isaiah. But he, at the end of it, he was supposed to add something. Something that was actually in the original verse in Isaiah. And that was to proclaim the acceptable year of God and the day of judgment. It was the day of God's wrath. He was holding that back because Jesus knew that that day was not yet. And some have said, well, that day's coming. That day is coming. And we see it in the book of Revelation. But I want to tell you, the day of vengeance of our God is not that day that's coming down the road. I believe Jesus held that back because Jesus knew that that was the next assignment in his ministry. The first three years, he was to heal the sick, to proclaim favor. But the last half year of his life on earth was to set his face like flint towards that cross. That was the day of vengeance. God punished with Jesus, he hung all the sin on Jesus so that all the wrath of heaven was released on him in one moment. And Jesus knew that the day of vengeance of our God meant something for him more than it did for us. 
It was going to shift us, but he was the one that was going to have to deal with it. Aren't you glad? You can escape the day of vengeance and only walk in the favor of Jesus. And so here's the prophecy. This word is coming. The spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor. He is sending you to heal the brokenhearted. He wants you to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He wants you to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And he wants you to proclaim the acceptable year of God. He wants you to prophesy the day of God's favor. Now, some of us are walking in this prophetic thing. It's an amazing thing to you know, God gives us, I, I just, I'm blown away. You know, when, when any time God actually speaks or uses someone, whether it's me or someone else, I'm always amazed. I never walk away going, yeah, that's, of course. I'm always amazed because I'm like, how did you download that into this brain? How did you give me that, God? That's, I mean, that just blows my mind. And so I believe that there's, there's more available but then he says this, he sits down and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And here's what I want to propose to you. After they say, is this not Joseph's son? They're marveling that this person that they knew in the natural, everyone knew who this person was. They all know, is this not Joseph's son? They can't recognize him by the spirit because they only see him in the natural. He's saying to them by doing this and seat, seat, sitting down, some say in the synagogue there was a chair known as Messiah's chair. Others say it was Moses' chair, and that was the chair that they read the law from. Either way, he sits down in this chair as if to say, I am the one you've been waiting for. I am the one that you've been waiting for. This scripture is, is fulfilled today in your hearing. Now watch this. I want to propose something to you because I believe this is something that as a prophetic culture we're going to recognize Jesus, in verse 23, says, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. You ever had those moments? You go away, you're somewhere else, and you see miracles, signs, and wonders, but you come back to your home church, and you're having a struggle, because it seems that it's not the level of favor or agreeability at home as you had on the road. I mean, you might as well be one of the two witnesses when you go on the road, but you come back and you have to do what everybody else is doing. And you're like, there's such a disconnect. Jesus himself experiences this. They said to Jesus, whatever we heard you do over there, do it here. Do the same miracles that we heard you do there. Do them here. And Jesus doesn't respond to their, to their, to, to, to their, what, their insecurity. He says, he says, this scripture is today fulfilled in your hearing. Not in your seeing, but in your hearing. The power of the word actually has an ability to be fulfilled in your hearing. When you hear it, some of us are waiting for a prophecy to happen. We're waiting for a moment. God, I know that when that moment comes, I will... I will see it, and that's the fulfillment of that prophetic word of my life. But I don't believe God's waiting on a moment. I believe God's waiting on a mindset. When he speaks something over you, he shifts your mind so that it mirror images what it is that he's speaking. He wants you to operate out of a mindset. When he prophesies over you that you're, you're going to heal the sick, operate out of the mindset that I am a healer in Jesus' name. When he says that you're going to prophesy, operate out of that mindset. Now I am a prophetic voice. I will step into that. Don't wait for the moment because the moment will come to pass. And if you let it, you can miss the mindset and miss the mark of your calling. There are some that see a moment come to pass. But it's just, it's a, it's a tipping point. It's something that speaks to us of better things. When, when God speaks over me, he says, I'm going to heal the sick through you. And then I pray for someone. They get healed of a headache. I don't go, that's the end. Praise God, I've just reached the top. No, that's just the beginning. Now I have a mindset that steps me into the fulfillment of that prophetic word whenever there is need. 
So he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Some of us have been waiting on words for 20 years. We're waiting for a fulfillment of that word when God is wanting you to embody and embrace the power of that word that you get it in you and you start behaving like that word speaks. You let it shift your character and the culture of your heart so that those things that are not become, you start speaking that those things that are not as though they were and God begins to move through you as if you're in the fulfillment of that prophetic word. Some of us have words on our life that we've been waiting for. I prophesy over people. And they say, that's amazing. I say, praise God, I'm, I'm excited. And they go, yeah, you're like the seventh person that's told me that. I'm like, what? What are you waiting for? Seven people. You need, on, on day two, when you hear that second word, you need to begin to operate out of that. Let it shift your mindset. Let it shift you into a miracle moment. And so he, Jesus says, this scripture is today fulfilled in your hearing. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you. Look, I, I want you to see this. Assuredly, verse 24. Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet. Say prophet. He says, no prophet is accepted in his own country. No prophet. You know, it's the hardest thing to be prophetic to your, your own family, to your own home base. You're called to be prophetic, you're called to, but people know you. People know your weaknesses. People know your difficulties. But you seem to be able to prophesy over everyone when you're away. But when you come back, he says, no prophet is accepted in his own country because the familiarity causes us to no longer regard or value the anointing in someone. But I find that if you begin to value those closest to you, that that prophetic word that they carry in their spirit will be a grace to your life. My family, my wife, my daughter, my son even, they're a prophetic word. When my son prays, you know how he prays? He said, let's pray for the meal. He says, amen. That's his prayer. <laughs> then he started saying, Jesus loves me, amen. I said, that's a beautiful prayer. Some of us need to begin to pray that prayer. Let's pray. Jesus loves me. Amen. Because I begin to hear God's voice in everyone around me. It's put me in a state of susceptibility where sometimes I have to discern whether that person is actually hearing from God or what spirit they, that, that's coming out of. or Is that coming out of emotion? Is that coming out of anxiety? Is that coming from a, a source from heaven? Where is that coming from? And suddenly everything begins to prophesy to you. You're walking around in nature and creation itself begins to speak to you, prophesy to you. God's not in the tree, but he made the tree and the tree can prophesy to you. You're hearing the word of the Lord. Suddenly some things begin to, to I mean, I, last year I planted five trees in my backyard. I, I saw four of them were alive. One of them was dying. I said, God, what's going on? He said, I want you to call your pastor. Tell him that he has five things that God has just given him. Five. I said, okay. And he, I said, what about the fifth? He says, tell him it's dying, but it will be healed. I call him. He goes, you're not going to believe this. But God just told me five things that we're to pick up as a ministry. And he named off each and every one of them. And he said, the fifth one is struggling, but I believe your word. Everything begins to speak to you. Suddenly, everything has potential. And then there's the other side of that same coin where you have to be careful. You have to be careful that you're not operating out of this insecurity where, or this craziness where suddenly every single license plate is a prophetic word to you. <laughs> one, one, one. Oh my gosh. Two, two, two. Oh, oh, three, 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 three. <laughs> there needs to be some level of normalcy to ground you out and get you human. We have this divine nature, but I believe one of the things that the prophetic needs to embrace is our humanity at the same time. Jesus wept when he was about to raise the dead. He wept for Lazarus 
when he's about to raise him from the dead. That doesn't sound like faith. What sounds like faith is, everybody dry your eyes. We're about to raise the dead. Let's do this. (laughs) But Jesus weeps, and then he raises the man from the dead. Some of us need to embrace our humanity and be willing to be vulnerable in front of others and actually say sometimes, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I need to seek God. I need to seek him. Some of us, the prophetic, especially when it begins to, to, the enemy comes against your identity and he goes, if you really are prophetic, then you would not, you would know this. If you really are prophetic, you would know this. The old prophets in the Old Testament would say, something's happening, but the Lord has hidden it from me. It was their way of staying spiritual while at the same time not knowing. You know, it's interesting, Jesus says this, no prophet is accepted in his own country, because then he mentions two names, and I want you to see this. He says, I truly tell you, Many widows were in Israel, we're in verse 25, in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up, three years, six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now, This began to mess with me. This passage began to mess with me because suddenly I'm seeing the prophetic from a brand new perspective, a totally different perspective. Something began to shape in my heart because the Holy Spirit came to me last year and he said, son, I want you to know I'm dropping a mantle on you. And he said, and I'm dropping a prophetic mantle on you. I've been prophesying for over a decade. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. But something began to spring up in me, and it wasn't more passion for the prophetic. It was more passion for healing, to see people get out of wheelchairs, to see cancer dissolve, to see eyes open, to see deaf ears unstop. All of a sudden, this emerging passion came out of this mantle, and it was mixed with compassion, And it caused me to step out and do things that I would normally sit back and just be comfortable and cozy prophesying. I could easily prophesy. I go, you know, there you go. You're going to get it. Someday you're going to get it. Someday it's going to happen. But it caused me to stick my neck out there and lean beyond my gift into this passion that's inside. The prophetic can, it can, I mean, you could prophesy anything and sound prophetic. But when you really see whether God's in something or not is whether there's immediate results right in front of your eyes. Jesus operates at healing. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And then he says, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And he tells about these two prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. Maybe you know about them. Elijah. He was the first. He walked in a miracle mantle, and Elijah had situational miracles. It was an amazing time in Israel's history. Elijah didn't walk in a preaching anointing. He didn't prophesy at the end of his meetings. He would stumble into situations that needed a miracle, and the miracles that he saw, the prophetic voice that he was in that hour, was situational. It was determined by the situations and the times he's living in. Some of us don't see our life as potential to be prophetic because our view or our version of the prophetic is someone that stands up in a meeting, has a microphone in their hand, and then prophesies at the end of their speech. What if I told you that you are in the middle, in your workplace, in your environment, in your family life, in the, in the normal, common, everyday things that you experience? God wants to put a prophetic anointing that it would eclipse anything you would ever see in here. Total eclipse. Because God's more often in the situations that we're in, in the random events of life, he's more often in those than in the box that we put him in 
in the prophetic. Elijah would walk into situations that needed a miracle. There was a widow he was sent to, he goes to, he proclaims a drought and famine comes on the land. And 1 Kings 17, it tells us this, that Elijah comes up to this woman and he says, bring out some water for me. I'm thirsty. Now, how selfish is this prophet? He just proclaimed a drought and now he's asking water for, from everybody else. He says, bring out some water. Now she knows he's the one that proclaimed the drought. He says, bring out some water for me. And she says, well, I'm going in and we're going to be making some food and some bread and my son and I, and we're going to die. And he goes, well, on your way in, could you also bring out some bread for me? <laughs> could you just do that? Doesn't the prophetic sometimes offend you? That's why scripture says, do not despise prophecies. Because there's an offensive manner to, to the prophetic. And I'm not talking about it's okay to be, you know, offensive. But it's, there's something about it that, you know, when you are in the middle of a plan and you're, you're gung-ho, you're ready to go, and God's, you're like, yeah, God's in this, God's in this. And then a prophet comes on, on the scene. And, God, and he says, give that up. God's got something else. And you're like, What? You have a choice. Do you despise the prophecy or do you trust the prophetic word? Do you trust what it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking? He says, when you go in, you're going to make some bread for yourself. Don't forget me. Bring some bread out for me as well. He starts off with water. Water is easy. Then he moves it to bread. And she says, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do this. He goes, listen. Listen. And he ups the ante even more. He says, how about you make me a cake? <laughs> Wait a second. We started off with water. How did we get to cake? We went from water to bread to cake. This doesn't make sense. But he says, you give me that cake. And your, your oil and your flour will never run out. In these years, there's something very special about the prophetic that it causes a resource to, to be provided when there is no resource. It's food to those who are hungry. I love the prophetic and I love the teaching ministry that comes with the prophetic. It says in Acts 13 that when Paul and Barnabas, they were all gathered together, that there were many prophets and teachers in that day. The prophetic ministry always pairs up with teaching. It's always at its best when there's a teaching ministry because it's not just understanding the theology of the word. It's understanding the relational value of the word. How to relate to God because God is prophetic in nature. And so it's food to people. It prophesies and it's food to our soul. But the prophetic is not just designed only to minister to the soul or minister to the spirit. There's something beyond that I want you to see. He says this, and many, in verse 27, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Many prophets. Now you have to think about this, that many lepers were in Israel, one prophet, and Jesus mentions these two prophets, and I believe is Jesus' validation of what true prophetic ministry looks like. That true prophetic ministry, number one, provides food to those who are hungry. Spiritual nourishment to those around us. True authentic ministry that is prophetic in nature gives life to people. I've been around some of the most interesting prophetic people, good and bad. And I've watched... People prophesy. I've watched people prophesy over suicidal people and then bring life to them. Where they jump up out of the chairs, they're excited for life, and now they're free forever from that suicidal spirit that was on them. Then I've watched people 
in some of the same meetings prophesy over other people with suicide and they walk out of the meeting more depressed than when they came into the meeting. Suddenly, the prophetic has taken a pathetic turn. It's no longer ministering life. And something in me says that we need a reformation of the prophetic right now that we can have trusted prophetic voices in churches across the nation, in cultures and communities across the nation, that we could trust that they're not going to screw things up. They're not going to prophesy death over things. They're not going to hurt people. When people get prophesied over by them, we know that they're going to get filled up and their life is going to overflow. It reminds me of Elijah when Elijah... He's with the woman who is a widow and her son dies. She says, what, are you here to reveal my sin and to bring judgment on my house that my son would die? How many have had only that version of the prophetic? That the prophetic is just hard to deal with. Prophetic people can be, you know, they, 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 they drum up bad things. But what if God wants to heal that in us so that we become life-giving? Elijah says, no, bring your son to me. He's going to rise from the dead. I believe God wants to bring a reformation to the prophetic that it begins to heal and not just prophesy or even be abrasive. We have people prophesying and they're telling about, you know, bad things coming, bad this, bad that, bad this, bad that. What, if we only have the sour and not the sweet, then we've lost the true value of the prophetic. And God wants to resurrect the prophetic and give it a fresh voice, fresh breath that we could prophesy healing and miracles and life-giving. So watch this. I want you to see this because he says in verse 27, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha. The prophet, none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. He's validating that this is the type of prophetic ministry that he believes is significant. Jesus believes is significant. What type of prophetic ministry is that? The type that heals people, that provides for people. But I want to prophesy something to you. I believe the second half of this prophetic ministry between Elijah and Elisha, the second half was what Elisha carried. That this second half is going to hit you. It's going to be a wave of healing. So that it's not just prophesying nourishment over people, but it becomes a resource for healing for the people that are sick and dying around us. He says, Naaman had leprosy and he was healed. This is the power of the prophetic. We've had these two kind of movements, a healing movement, and we've had a prophetic movement. They've been going two different directions. I believe we are in the convergence of both of these. And it's when these came together in the 1940s and 50s healing revival that some of the greatest ministries began to spring forth and the greatest miracles we saw began to spring forth. And suddenly the prophetic became life-giving, not just prophesying end-time events or prophesying corporate or this or that or governmental this, but it began to be healing for people, healing for people. We were just in, I was just down in, I'm watching this word play out because I was just down in, uh, in Georgia and there was this man and I got curious, I came up to him. And he said, I've got something wrong with my foot. And I looked at him in his eyes and I said, yeah, but there's something else going on. He said, what? I said, I don't know, but I see Holy Spirit's touching your eyes. He says, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. Do you have something wrong with your eyes? He says, yes, I do. I said, well, let's pray. We prayed. The power of God hit him. We spoke life. We got the word of knowledge. I go, now, is it better? He says, yes, it's all better. Now, I was good enough with that. I said, that's amazing. He found me afterwards, and he said, my eyes are all better. I'm, I go, thank God. What happened to you? He goes, well, look at my glasses. He pulls his glasses out, and he's got these lenses. One of them has lines across it. He shows me that these lines are like a prism, 
and they're lined up in one of his spectacles where the other one is absolutely clear and he, have to, he has to wear these because his eyes don't see level when, they, when he's looking at someone. If he closed one eye, one person would be this tall. If he opened the other eye, that same person would be this short because his eyes saw from different perspectives. But when the prophetic hit him, he was healed in that very moment. He said, I don't need these glasses anymore. I've been healed. That's the power of the prophetic. I believe a new level of healing is coming, and it's going to mix together with your prophetic anointing. What it is that you've been carrying, you've been prophesying, and I believe God is going to begin to minister. And here's what, here's what happens. Naaman, he says this. He's got leprosy. You know the story. And there's a young servant girl. She came from Israel. She's in the Syrian household, and she says, if you are in Israel, in Jerusalem, there is a prophet in that land who can heal the sick. Not a healing evangelist, a prophet. If there is a prophet in that land, you would be near him, and he could heal you of your sickness. He could heal you of your sickness. He says, well, bring him to me. I want to go. And he says, no, no, you have to go to him. You've got to go to where he is. So he packs his bags up. He goes to him, and he says, I know what he'll do. He'll wave his hand over me, and he'll speak healing over me. And he says, no. He says, I want you to do something different. Elisha says, I want you to go wash in the muddy Jordan seven times. He goes, that's crazy. This thing is dirty. You want me to wash in dirty water? to be healed and cleansed, and he says, yes, I want you to do it. He walks away sorrowful. He walks away, scripture tells us that he walked away like disappointed, heartbroken, because he knew he could just simply speak the word, but he has me step out and do something I would never do naturally. He says, his servant was with him, and he says, if the prophet asked you to do a hard thing, would you not have done it? If he asked you to do a hard thing, would you not have done it? And he goes, well, yeah, that's a good point. I guess that's, I would do that. And so he goes and he washes himself at the Jordan and his leprosy is cleansed. I believe that God is going to cause prophetic things to happen when it comes to the healing movement, things that we've never seen before. I just heard... Uh, crazy testimony. Where's Paul Martini? Paul Martini, who's here, and he's one of the, the ministries that's part of this team. And a, a young lady said, I want you to spit in my eyes, and I'll be healed. He says, what do you mean? And she had something wrong with his eyes, or with her eyes. And she, Is that woman here? Is she here? I want to see. And he says, I don't want to do that. She says, well, Jesus did it. And he goes, well, okay, if you want me to do that. And he rubs some spit together and put it in her eyes, and she was instantly healed in her eyes. Now, I'm not proposing that you go out hitting people or spitting on people, but I am proposing that God is going to ask you to do some things that you wouldn't normally do to step into your prophetic call. He's going to ask you to do some normal things that you things that you would never do. Lay hands on the sick. Maybe you're sitting cozy in your prophetic anointing. I could just prophesy all day long. But he wants you to step out and believe him for healing. It's amazing to me because Elisha, he actually prophesied that that woman that he's with in 2 Kings, he says to her, you're going to bear a son, and that son dies. That same son that he prophesies dies. And they said, that, that woman who, was, who, who you prophesied over, the man and the wife, their son, he's dead. And he says, well, let's go and raise him from the dead. And this is what's amazing to me. He has this staff. It was the staff that he, was, he operated out of his miraculous powers with that same staff. Elisha walked around doing signs, wonders, and miracles. That was this, it was this special staff. And he says, well, get the boy, bring him to a bed, and lay this staff on him. 
lay this staff on him and he'll rise. So they bring the boy, they put his staff on him and the boy does not rise. Elisha is confused. He's like, what's going on? I've been here before. I, I, I know this can happen. I know that boy's going to rise. And so he, he hears from the Lord. He begins to pray. It says he shut himself in the room with the boy. And he began to pray. And so he prays to God. And God must have moved in his heart because he removes the staff from the boy's body. That thing that he had been so reliant on in times past. And he put himself out on that boy's body, stretched his body out face to face, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, foot to foot, heart to heart. And he connected body to body with that boy and that boy was raised from the dead. I believe that the prophetic movement that is emerging right now is not willing to get their hands dirty. They're willing to actually, listen, because there's a bunch of prophetic critics that they're just, you know, cozy YouTube prophets that prophesy out the, oh, the world this, this, that, but they're not out there getting their hands in situations and letting healing flow through them. But this emerging prophetic movement, God is going to release, going out there, laying hands on the sick, praying for people. Sometimes people, all they need is a hug. It might be the most important prophetic thing you do for that person. Just give them a hug. And the power of God will flow through you. Freeing them from years of pain and trauma. Difficulty. Put your hands on someone and just reach out and touch them. We know Elijah walked in a single portion. Elisha carried the double portion. I want to prophesy over you today that there's a double portion coming to you. Elijah, single portion, got him to close the heavens up. Rain didn't come. Did amazing things. He prophesied amazing things. But uh, Elisha's double portion, raised the dead, cleansed the leper. I believe God's going to move on you right now. It put a healing movement in this house, in this place. We're going to start to see 100% accuracy in the healing movement. Some of you are going to become 100% accurate, sensitive to diabetes. And when you lay hands on someone with diabetes, they'll be healed. Someone, some of us in here are going to be 100% accurate with cancer. When you're around someone with cancer, God's going to give you a telltale sign it's going to be a word of knowledge to you, a prophetic anointing that hits you to let them know God's touching them and healing them of cancer. And you'll see 100% accuracy when it comes to healing cancers and diseases. Some are going to have different anointings that they're going to be graces, glorious graces that are going to draw people from all over. Graces that make people's legs grow out where one leg is shorter than the other. And other graces that make people grow taller. Amen. But there's going to be different graces that are going to be released. And they're going to flow through you. And some of you are going to touch those people and watch 100% accuracy flow through your ministry. People are going to know and hear. If you were in that place, in that church, in that environment, in that business, in that community... They have someone there. They have a prophetic voice there that can heal the sick. There's going to be holy rumors that go out about you. Where they're going to speak about you and declare, this is what God is doing. He's healing through these people. I believe it's time for the prophetic movement and the prophetic culture to lean into healing unlike ever before.